thanks to Soltech Solutions for sponsoring this episode of On The Ledge. Without their help, I couldn't bring you all this planty chat. I love working with brands that I've tried out and I can truly recommend. And that's certainly the case with Soltech Solutions. I can tell you from personal experience that their lights are superior quality, sturdy, stylish and effective. Soltech Solutions' fabulous customer service means you won't be left in the dark when it comes to buying great grow lights. Choose from their range of track lights, pendant style lights, or a simple bulb that will screw into most standard light fittings for setup that takes just moments. Check out Soltech Solutions' range of lights now at soltechsolutions.com and get 15% off with the code on the ledge. That's soltechsolutions.com. Enter code on the ledge for 15% off. Settle back with your choice of beverage. It's time for On The Ledge Podcast. Tea, please. No sugar. Dash of milk. I'm your host, Jane Perrone, and this week's show is dedicated to the delightful foliage plant known as Phytonia, a.k.a. the nerve plant. Plus, I answer a question about notching. Does the nerve plant get on your nerves? This is a plant that I think splits opinion because some people absolutely love the beautifully intricate foliage with its veins lit up in colours of either white, pink or red, while others find its tendency to faint, collapsing suddenly due to lack of moisture, just a bit too annoying to make it a worthwhile plant. I only grow phytonias in terrariums because, heck, life is too short and I just can't keep them going unless they are under glass. But let's find out a little bit more about this fascinating foliage plant, where it comes from, its history and how to look after it. I do like about Phytonia is that the genus name honours a pair of botanists called Elizabeth and Sarah Fitton. These Irish sisters were the authors of a book called Conversations on Botany, which came out in 1817. And this covered basic botany, scientific classification and more. And it was set up as a conversation between a mother and a son. And this kind of approach to teaching about botany was actually fairly typical of that time. They called it didactic dialogue, didactic just meaning teaching. And it was based on the ancient ideal of platonic dialogue as popularised by Plato. So the idea that by talking something through, you could learn a lot more than you would do from a lecture format. Sound fancy? It certainly was. Here's a little extract. Oh, here is a nice little blue flower. I should like to take it home. It is so pretty. Mother. Do so, my dear. And if you can tell me the class and order it belongs to, I will show you how to find out its name in Withering's Botany. Edward. I see only two stamens and one pistil, so that I suppose it is in the second class and the first order. Am I right? Yes, perfectly right. But you must remember, if you can, to call each class and order by the names Linnaeus gave them. Wow, it's just like listening to an episode of On the Ledge circa 1800 and something, isn't it? Well, not really, but you get the idea. And this was one of the books that helped to cement the idea that women could actually study botany in a scientific way. You can have a look at the book online. It is available online because obviously it's long 
out of copyright. I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to have a look at that book. And the botanist who decided to name the genus Phytonia was Eugène Comans, who was a, a Belgian botanist. And it was in 1865 that he decided to coin Phytonia as a genus. The Fitton sisters actually had another genus named after them, Afrophytonia. Now, you can guess probably that Afrophytonia is a genus of plants from Africa. And in fact, there's only one species in the genus, which is Afrophytonia sylvestris. Now, I haven't seen any pictures of the plant other than botanical specimens, which are obviously pressed and dried. So I can't really tell how similar Afrophytonia is to the Fetonia that we know and love. But, and they are both members of the Acanthus family, so the Acanthaceae. And if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, how many other houseplants are members of the Acanthus family? I can't think of any. Well, there are a few, probably not as well known as the Aroids or, or the Cactaceae. But if no Acanthus family plants come to mind, let me give you a few. There's Persian Shield, the lovely rich purple and dark green leaves of Strobilanthes diarianus, um, the monkey plant, Ruellia macoyana, another acanthus family plant, and the Aphalandra genus also comes under that family. And finally, uh, Hypoestes. Now, these often get mixed up, actually. Phytonias and the polka dot plant or freckle face, Hypoestes philostaca. I've actually seen whole articles written by quite well known horticulturists in which they are writing about Phytonias, but illustrating it with a picture of Hypoestes. So these two do get mixed up. The Acanthus family plant Hypoestes philostaca or sanguinolenta, as it used to be in my day is actually from Madagascar, whereas the Phytonia, well, they are from South America. Although Hypoestes is quite widely naturalised in South America, which I think is why sometimes they get confused. But the Hypoestes variegation is dotty as opposed to the lining of the veins that we see with Phytonia. So it was the 1850s and 1860s when these Phytonias started to be and I'm putting big inverted commas around this word, discovered in parts of South America, northern South America. So there are two species that are currently listed by Q. As with most genera, there's been a bit of jiggery pokery over the years, moving plants around and giving them different names. But Q's definitive, or as near as you can get to being definitive, guide Plants of the World Online lists two species, Gigantia and Albivanus. And they come from Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, and a little bit of northern Brazil. The Gigantia's range is limited to Ecuador and Peru. I think that both of these species have been used in the breeding of the modern hybrids that we know and love today. There are so many different variations on the Phytonia theme out there. And you'll find them under names like Verschelfeltii, and Argyrinura. The way this is usually dealt with is by putting the plants into two groups, both with the species name Alvivanus. One is Argyrinura group, one is Verschafeltii group. And under those banners come lots of the plants we know and love. So the Argyrinura group, that's all the ones that have basically got white veins and the Verschafeltii are all the pinky red ones. So what was going on in the 1850s and 60s where the Fetonias first came to be known by white Western horticulturists and botanists? So this was a time when obviously lots of plant hunters were fanning out across South America and finding all kinds of plants and transporting them to the UK and North America for collectors to grow and it's amazing how quickly this plant suddenly starts appearing in archive material uh, from newspapers around the year 1866 1867 suddenly you start reading all these newspaper reports about flower shows where people were showing off their phytonias so literally only a, a year or so after this genus was given its name phytonia it had been known as gymnostachium uh, somewhat before that but 
very quickly, these very well off growers, you know, you had to be very well off to ha have your own heated greenhouse at this time if you were in the UK uh, or their gardeners would be showing these plants at shows and they were getting quite a lot of acclaim for them. And where did Kermans find the plant? Well, I have read that the plant came from the famous British plant hunter and breeder and salesman extraordinaire, Mr. William Bull. And But as is so often the case, the reality is somewhat lost in the mists of time. And in fact, I've got a copy of the Gardener's Chronicle from 1866 in front of me, in which Mr. William Bull's catalogue of novelties just issued... Establishment for New and Rare Plants, Kings Road, Chelsea, South West London, included reference to new plant, Phytonia argyronura, the handsomest new plant of the season, easily cultivated in any stove. Price 21 shillings. How much is that worth in today's money? Anywhere between about 60 and 70 pounds. So, yeah, I guess quite expensive for a new introduction. But then again, Look at what people are paying for new introductions today. So in the newspaper, the Nottinghamshire Guardian, published on the 17th of May, 1867, there is a report about the Royal Horticultural Society weekly show. Yes, they used to hold shows weekly back then. Can you imagine? And it's a detailed report of everybody who took part and who won what. And it lists quite a few new plants that were being shown by... Veach and Sons, who were a very famous nursery at the time, which included things like Begonia Pearcii and Anthurium regali. And w one of the other plants there is the silvery veined Phytonia argyronura. So just a couple of years after it was first given its genus name, it's already appearing at RHS shows. And the popularity spread from there. The East Kent Gazette the following year, the Faversham show included a display of Phytonia argyronura, a very superior plant, apparently, who's got second prize for Mr. Newman, gardener at Torrey Hill, which is um, a country house in Kent, basically. Well, that's enough about colonialism in action. Let's have a look at how this plant grows in the wild. This plant is a terrestrial rather than an epiphytic plant, so it grows tightly hugging the ground rather than up in a tree. It's usually described as a creeping herb, and it grows, not surprisingly, in the understory. So I can imagine if you're wandering through the forest, probably this plant would blend in very well with those veined leaves, although they may look dramatic against a plain backdrop. If you were faced with a mass of foliage, those variegated veins would actually make it quite hard to spot. Although these are classified as foliage plants, they do produce flowers. They're just very, very, very boring flowers. They're kind of green, spikes, nothing really to write home about. So definitely snip those out as they appear. Now, there are several traditional medicinal uses for these plants. I've read quite a few reports that they were fed to dogs to improve their ability to hunt, that they were used for headache treatments by some of the tribes of the Ecuadorian Amazon, and also as a hallucinogen and a liver medicine. So I would say, please don't try any of that at home. There has been some initial research into whether Phytonia would work as a headache remedy, but I think we'll leave that to the experts to establish before we start eating large quantities of Phytonia. It is reported to be non-toxic for dogs and cats, so it's a good one to choose if you have nibblers in your household. <laughs> Settle our nerves with a dose of question of the week. And it comes from Alexander, who wanted to know about notching as a way of encouraging ficus to branch out in the world. What is this technique and what do I need to achieve it? Well, notching is deceptively simple, I guess. 
it's just making a little cut into the trunk of your plant to, in order to encourage it to create side shoots which turn into branches and a more overall bushy look. How does it work? Well, all you're simply doing is reducing the supply of the hormone auxin to the growth point of the plant. The plant will note that the supply route for that auxin to reach the growing tip has been stopped or reduced and as a result it will redirect those growth hormones to the side shoots and hopefully stimulate the places where those side shoots come out and make them appear. The position where you want to do the notch is above a node, the node just being the point where the leaf stalk or the petiole joins the stem and you want to go just above that and be brave because you do need to cut reasonably deep usually rubber plants I've got quite woody stems and so you should be able to go in a decent way obviously don't cut the whole thing off but you want to go about a quarter of a way into that trunk make sure you're using a really sharp pruning knife that you've cleaned beforehand make sure it's sterile by just running it over a naked flame and if you do this above various nodes on the stem it should encourage side shoots to come out of those stems it depends the shape you're looking for and it is a bit of an unpredictable process it's very easy to say oh yes cut here but the results are different according to different plants so bear that in mind when you are thinking about where to chop you can do this notching at any time of year, but, you know, springtime is generally the best time to do this because that's when the sap is rising in the plant and the response will hopefully be the quickest. Usually it's recommended that you do the cut at an angle. To be honest, I'm not sure if that makes any difference, <laughs> but probably worth doing it at an angle if you can. Oh, and, you know, going into mum mode, obviously be careful, wear gloves, do not cut yourself, but do use a nice sharp knife to do it. Because it's the old saying, you know, if you use a blunt knife, you're much more likely to cut yourself than a sharp one. Why would you want to do this to uh, ficus? Well, oftentimes ficus will just grow straight up, uh, and end up looking like a bean pole and you may want your plant to look bushy rather than a bean pole you may also experience that thing where your ficus loses lots of leaves a very common experience with ficus and this is one way of recovering the situation you can obviously prune off the top of the stem the growing point and it will branch but notching is a slightly less obvious way of getting results for a more bushy plant i hope that helps alexander and if you've got a question for on the ledge drop me a line to on the ledge podcast at gmail.com there are absolutely loads of fitonia hybrids cultivars god knows what out there and I have to say, a lot of them look quite similar to each other. Uh, there's been a lot of breeding done with this plant. I'm going to list a few ones that I think are notable, but there are many out there. So do tell me what your favourites are. It, it really depends on what your sense of style is like. If you like the idea of a lime green plant with bright pink veins, then skeleton is probably the one for you. Titanic, despite the name, is actually a small white veined uh, cultivar. One of the ones I like least, although it is much more subtle than some of the other variations, is Daisy, which has got a kind of a grey green look to the leaves and some cream variegation on there as well. When it comes to display, terrariums are great should you mix up different colours, sizes, and so on. There are some with ruffled leaves as well. I'm thinking of one called Frankie. I don't really like the ruffled leaves, but I know some people rather like the free shirt effect that this one gives. One of the named cultivars that I think is the best is Fortissimo. I've seen it on sale at Ikea and it's just got these very nice leaves. They're kind of almost quilted with a mid-green background and then this really, really intense hot pink veining quite simple as opposed to the network that you sometimes get with some of the other members of this genus. 
I think this is the one that Jamie's song of Jamie's Jungle had for ages, which looked absolutely amazing. When it comes to care of this plant, that dramatic fainting that I talked about earlier puts it in the category of a bit of a diva. It's like a peace lily. It will dramatically wilt, but sometimes it's worse than the peace lily in that it's harder to revive. The leaves don't have such a waxy cuticle. They're really quite thin. And so it gets to the point of no return a lot quicker than a peace lily will. And thus the interwebs are littered with reports of people whose phytonias did not make it accompanied by pictures of pots of crispy leaves. It does like to fake its own death except sometimes it's not faking it. If your plant does start to get all droopy what can you do? Well it's important to take action as quickly as you can because every minute that goes by is producing more stress in the plant which can impact on its health for quite a long time so that even if you manage to revive it the plant may never be quite the same again. Get it in a bucket of water stat. A room temperature bucket of water, you can dunk the whole pot in there that will enable the plant to very quickly rehydrate and have its best chance. Yes it doesn't look great for a time-lapse photography if you want to capture the moment of your phytonia's revival but it is a good way of getting your plant to come back to life then just let it drain off and sit it back in its usual location maybe even switching it to a slightly darker area just to let it recover before it goes back to its normal home The other thing you can do to a badly wilted phytonia is once you have watered it, stick it in a clear plastic bag. By raising the humidity around the plant, it will just help it to recover. And maybe you could swap it over to a terrarium when you have a chance. And this is a plant that is a really good candidate for a self-watering container because that way you avoid these issues. Or indeed, you can use wick watering on it where you just poke a wick up through the bottom of the pot made of uh, nylon cord and then join that up to a reservoir below with water and pebbles and that way the plant can kind of give itself a drink whenever it needs one. Remember it's an understory plant right at ground level so coping with deep shade, the deep shade you get outside as opposed to the deep shade of our houses which is probably just about double the darkness of the South American forests If you put a plant in really deep shade, I've got one, a terrarium in my room, which is definitely not getting enough light, which is contains phytonias and it's doing okay. The leaves have gone very small. The plant just can't afford to put too many resources into making new leaves. So if I move that somewhere lighter, cut it back and move it somewhere lighter, the leaf size will increase again. But it can cope with low light for quite a long time and it's so low maintenance once it's in a terrarium. You don't want to put it in too much light because the glass acts as a big magnifying glass and will burn the plant. Plus also it can get just too hot in there. So keep it out of direct sun. It's something that you could put into a low light area for a few weeks and then move it somewhere else just so it can stock up on light levels. This is a plant that doesn't like to get too cold. You you don't want it to get any lower than about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 15 and a half centigrade. It is a plant that will get straggly over time, whatever you do. So just make sure that you trim it back occasionally. Propagation is really easy. Just take off some stem cuttings, stick them in a glass of water or a clear plastic bag with a bit of water in it and you will grow new cuttings quite easily. And it's always a good idea to have some on hand because you never know when you're going to forget to water for a few days for a plant that isn't in a terrarium and deal with that sudden death that we've talked about already. One other note on caring for this plant, you will sometimes find this plant in aquarium shops. This is a bit of a red herring, although it's been sold for a long time as a plant for aquariums in some aquarium shops. It really is not suitable for that purpose. Yes, it likes damp soil. No, it does not like to be submerged long term. It will probably last up to about six months grown that way. But beyond that, it will die. So is it much point buying a plant like that for such a short amount of time? 
I don't think it's very sustainable. So it's not something I would recommend, but you will see it quite widely. In terms of display, I think if you're not going to have the plant in a terrarium, personally, I love the effect of having a mass of one colour in a trough or in a bowl or something like that. I think it looks really great. Now, I said these were plants that grow well in terrarium settings and right back from when they were very first brought to Europe, they were considered to be plants that were good for the Wardian case, the very first incarnation of the mini glass house. The Handbook of Plants and General Horticulture, which came out in 1890, also suggested growing them on the surface of pots or tubs in which large plants or other decorative plants are grown and for forming narrow borders to the walks in heated structures. And indeed, you can see plants growing this way. I've seen plants growing this way at Wisley, where they have them as an uh, you know, as a path edging because they're just so attractive that way and hug hugging the ground. So as they were doing back in the 1860s, you can use Fetonia as ground cover around bigger plants. I did see a rather striking display. I'm going to use the word striking and you can interpret my meaning as you will on a Facebook group where somebody had partnered up the Euphorbia platyclada in the centre. That's the dead stick plant from Madagascar that is quite a sort of abstract looking succulent that does look a bit like a dead stick but really cool i love it's one of my favorite succulents and around it they put a beautiful selection of different photonias and i love the look of it it was very gaudy and very over the top and yeah really cool but i fear that this combination is not going to work because as we've already discussed those photonias they do like moisture and of course the euphorbia platyclada is going to object to that apparently they put it in its own pot and soil but i'm still not sure that's going to work i think that might end up ending disastrously i would not recommend growing these in a terracotta pot they just evaporate too much moisture and will make it very hard to keep the substrate moist. I mean, I guess you could if you had a tray un of water underneath, the, the plant could be sucking up all the time, but generally probably best avoided. I have seen some boutique plant shops selling little terrarium eggs, little tiny domes with a single phytonia underneath sat on a bed of moss. These are kind of cute and adorable. But as ever, you could probably make one of these yourself by getting, I don't know, even a big brandy glass and upending that over a pot of Fetonia could look great. Even if the terrarium doesn't have a lid, just being in that close environment will just help to keep your plant going that long, bit longer. Just make sure you're carefully measuring how much water you're putting on there, because obviously there is nowhere for that water to go and root rot could easily follow. When you're repotting this plant, do you think about making sure that the soil is fairly moisture retentive? You can add something like vermiculite, which holds moisture quite nicely and will mean that you have to water less often. And while I'm talking about terrariums, small public service announcement, please do not put asparagus plumosus into a terrarium even if you can buy this plant as a tiny plant, it grows so fast and it just isn't suitable for terrariums. They can get very tall very, very quickly. It's not a slow grower. Do not put it in a terrarium with your Fetonia. Please don't do it to yourself. Life's too short. Fetonias are also often recommended for bioactive or terrascaped environments that they're much better for this purpose than they are for aquariums and they will work quite well in a in a damp setup where it's okay for it to be damp they don't grow fast enough to cause any problems at all that's all for this week's On The Ledger, I will be back next Friday like the proverbial bad penny turning up in your pod app of choice. Until then, keep yourself and your plants well fed and watered. Bye!
The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops. The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku. Mozart's Eine Kleine Nacht Musik performed by the Advent Chamber Orchestra. And Whistle by Benjamin Banger. And the ad music was Dill Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. See the show notes for details. Thank you.